Hello, I'm Angela Mettler. I'm an administrative assistant in the president's office at South Dakota Mines, and welcome to Steam Cafe for May. Uh, we, uh, the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, has a partnership with South Dakota Public Broadcasting and Haycamp to do this every third Tuesday. Uh, so we appreciate their support, and we appreciate your support as well. Uh, this event is being live streamed on Zoom. So those of you who are attending virtually, you will have a chance to ask questions of the presenters at the very end. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat function or the Q&A, and we will ask them live uh, at the end. And those of you here in person as well can participate in the Q&A. Uh, so without further ado, Dr. Donovan and Dr. Keller. Great, and, and thank you all for coming. If you're from Rapid City, you should be mowing your lawn right now. So I, I, <laughs> I appreciate everybody here. I'll get away from this microphone or this uh, camera. Uh, we're gonna break this up into roughly two halves. I'm gonna go through kind of the history of local clays and ceramics. Um, and then Dr. Donovan will take it and talk more about this, the student work that, that really parallels a lot of what people have been doing for the last hundred years in various forms in the Black Hills with Black Hills Minerals. And, and so let's just a little bit about Black Hills Minerals. And, you know, when we think of the Black Hills, a lot of times we uh, historically think of it in terms of the gold rush. And so we celebrate the, the days of 76 and uh, dis gold discovery days in Custer and that, that HBO series Deadwood. But I, as I was putting this together, I came to the c conclusion that while the gold gets all the kind of the glory, we've really been uh, processing and mining minerals in the Black Hills that have sustained us far beyond the gold. And we talk in terms of industrial minerals, so what's an industrial mineral? Basically a, a mineral that we use for its value, not the metal value, but the mineral value. And here's a, an image of a, a clay. If, if you ever go behind the School of Mines, really on all sides of the School of Mines, you'll, you'll find this clay, it's called Belfu Shale, uh, that has actually been quite useful to us as we've learned how to process materials. And so we're gonna focus a lot on these industrial minerals. Um, and, and this is really kind of a, a tribute to uh, the people that came before us using these industrial minerals and then the students over the last two years, how they've utilized them as part of a National Science Foundation uh, curriculum integration grant that we, we've called Art and Engineering. So we're gonna go through some of the highlights of these, the different minerals. And then Dr. Donovan will, will talk about the how the students have applied them. One big one, probably the, the biggest, uh, the, the most used mineral uh, in the Black Hills is limestone, calcium carbonate. If you go down Sturgis Road, look on both sides, you see a lot of limestone uh, naturally and also being mined and processed. Uh, locally. Muscovite, most of us call it mica. If you walk up uh, to Black Elk Peak, look down, you see mica everywhere in the Southern Hills, uh, primarily around Keystone and Custer, a lot of mica deposits. Mount Marillonite, uh, up in the Northern Hills, we call it bentonite, commonly. It's kitty litter, you know, Train cars of kitty litter go by the school every day. Well, it, it, it is, it's bentonite as it goes by, but it ends up in Chicago as kitty litter and comes back to us. Uh, Montmorillonite, it's an a, a interesting material. Uh, kale and clay, uh, we've been in search of uh, good kale and clay deposits. Dr. Donovan will tell you why. And uh, a little more scarce, as we'll see then these other materials. And we found some along the Skyline Drive, Hogback, and along M Hill. The geologists have been great saying, first, you know, why, why do you care? And then they'll get a Google map and circle this spot and say, go look here. And we found some along Skyline Drive and M Hill. 
And then quartz, quartz is everywhere, right, in the Black Hills. And for ceramics, I, I, I say it's a little bit like making chili. You need some basic ingredients. And these are kind of the basic ingredients and the combinations that we're gonna put them together will influence the final product. But the Black Hills is beautiful because they're all there. You just have to find them. And Feldspar, once again, the Southern Hills, there are world-class deposits of some of these minerals, uh, particularly Feldspar, world-class. It's, it's in, in the pottery literature, they talk about Custer Feldspar. It's very famous. And of course, some of these other ones as well. And then that, that image in the last slide, that why I call it wild clay, and that's basically kind of a feral clay, if you will. That it's a it's a Duke's mixture of a lot of these different minerals. And, and as I noted, that the shale deposit, that Belfu shale, is all around the, the school. And it's kind of a it's a nuisance mineral because of how it reacts when you're trying to build construction. It's really a, a nuisance. Is I'm sure the the, the construction people in the new mineral industries building could attest to it's just not a, a good uh, construction material, but it's has some interesting clay properties. So some of these minerals have been, like I said, have been mined and processed for a long, long time. Uh, some of these companies, I'm sure if you're local, you'll uh, can relate to them limestone. Pete Lean and Sons, 1944, they're still going strong today. Uh, Mica, uh, up in, in, outside of Custer, uh, Pacer Corporation started in 1978, still going strong producing uh, mica. Montmorillonite, that kitty litter material, two big producers uh, that near Belfouche and, and some in, into Wyoming, uh, huge, huge bentonite deposits. You can see bentonite performance minerals over 90 years. I couldn't find an exact starting date, but they've been around a long, long time. And that Custer Feldspar, the, the notable Custer Feldspar Pacer produces both a mica product and a Feldspar product. And that Feldspar goes out, train cars to New York to make Corel dinnerware. Um, Pacer's been around since 1978. So let's focus a little bit on uh, the production using different minerals. And by far, by far the biggest consumer is cement, and I call it a limestone-based cer ceramic. Uh, the, so if the, the, the base material is that limestone. They also use shale, clay, quartz, and a bit of iron ore that they can find up by Nemo to make uh, Portland cement. All of those minerals are available within the Black Hills. And they're, they're mixed in a kiln from about 1300 to 1450 C to react the minerals to form the Portland cement. Now this, this is an image of a kiln. You probably recognize that, right? Going down Deadwood, uh, uh, West Chicago Street there, the, the cement plant huge kiln. So the minerals start at the top and react in high temperature and come out as what they call clinker, which is a, a, a base material for Portland cement. The state of South Dakota started that cement plant in uh, 19, uh, 1923. So now 100 years ago, uh, the, the state got into the cement business. And in 2000, sold it to GCC for 252 million which was probably a steal. Looking back at the value of the limestone deposits, the plant itself, and uh, just the, the value. But if, if you tour the cement plant, GCC has been a great uh, host for that cement plant and put a lot of money into modernizing it that the state never could quite do. And they continue to uh, operate it today. Um, but the consumer of that is primarily that, that limestone that comes from West Rapid City. So turning to the, what I call clay-based ceramics, 
Uh, so the clay then is the primary uh, part of the, the mix. This is a, a rather busy slide from one of our textbooks, but I like it because it shows that you, you need quartz, you need a clay, and you need feldspar, right? We've got all those in the Black Hills. You mix them together, you add water, you form it into a desired shape, you let it dry, air dry, put it in a kiln, fire it, and you, you make some nice product. And so those are the starting materials. All you need to do is add water, dry it, fire it in a kiln now at about 1,000 degrees C. And after it's fired, you put on a decorative glaze. And Dr. Donovan will talk a lot about glazes and how they need to fit on that ceramic piece. But this is, this is porcelain, and it's, it's difficult to make porcelain with Black Hills minerals simply because that clay tends to be uh, contaminated a little bit with iron. It doesn't come out uh, nice white. It's an orange or a red, as we'll see. But that's the basic process of ceramics. Mix the minerals, add water, form the part, let it dry, and fire it, and, and you end up with a nice product. So uh, the production of ceramics, clay-based ceramics, isn't nearly as huge as the cement plant. But there's some really interesting history, though, that we dug up. First, we found out that before 1900, almost every Black Hills town of a meaningful size and those along the Missouri River made their own bricks. And it wasn't until cheaper lumber came into being that those brick plants went away. So a lot of what we're, we're doing with the students, we're kind of reinventing what happened probably in the 1880s and uh, so on and so forth uh, with those brick manufacturing companies. And this is just a, where we got that, that information from an old uh, US Bureau of Mines report. There's, a, a, there's an interesting company just outside of Belfouche called Black Hills Clay Products. You can see they operated for over 25 years and at one point were producing 3,700 bricks per hour. And uh, a graduate student from Belfouche said, oh yeah, they, they, built, they, they made the bricks for the high school that he went, went to. So it, it was pretty substantial by uh, uh, brick production standards. And that particular deposit is uh, three miles south of Belfouche. So just as you're coming into town, if you look off on the right, you see these white bluffs where they were uh, taking their uh, minerals, which are rich in quartz and kaolin, enough to, to be able to produce some, some bricks. The, the, probably the most interesting one that, that, at least from my perspective, is this Rushmore pottery. They started out call, calling themselves perma clay, and it was two artists that were working with Guts and Borglum on the carving of Mount Rushmore, got crossways with Guts and Borglum, and decided to make their own pottery. They, they found a deposit three and a half miles north of Hermosa. So somewhere between Hermosa and Rapid City, they found a clay deposit that allowed them to make some, some really interesting pieces uh, they operated that, uh, that pottery. There was a storefront in Keystone that they were selling their uh, pottery to the, the first tourists coming to see Mount Rushmore uh, between 1935 and 1942. And if you go on the internet, and there was a, a great article in the Capital Journal of all places in 2019 that uh, talked about this whole story of these two artists uh, they called it permaclay initially because they said they could take a pot, and it, there's some examples coming around. They said they could take a pot and throw it across a room and it wouldn't break. Don't, please don't do that with this, this pot uh, because it's, it's over 80 years old, but we, we found some out uh, on eBay um, that, that are still out there, and those little figurine boots are also coming around. Uh, they said that they experimented with a lot of glaze where you get the, the color, and they were experimenting with some glazes. The green glaze was based on a uranium ore, 
And you, you think, well, in, in the 1930s, they probably didn't realize that uranium wasn't a good uh, metal to be making glazes out of. But these are brown, so I, I think we're, we're probably, probably okay. But that, that was really a, a fascinating story, and uh, we're going to have to find out where this clay deposit is uh, between here and Hermosa. And then, of course, this, this one, if you if you were in Rapid City up until 2021, you remember the Sioux Pottery Building. Um, this is, uh, they, they shut down production in 2021, and the only information I could find is that they did use uh, some local clays for the clay body, but I don't think the glazes that, that they used were uh, of Black Hills origin. But for you know, almost uh, 60 years, they were producing pottery out of soup pottery there. But there's currently no large scale production of ceramics beyond the cement plant that I mentioned uh, going on. And you know, what, what does happen locally, there's a, a lot of smaller scales, pottery to paint, birthday parties. Uh, Prouty Pottery does a lot of training and they have little parties as well. And the Doll Arts has 12 potter's wheels where they do a lot of, a lot of training, but it's, it's ma mainly small scale uh, parties and such. And we, when we got into this now about a year and a half ago, uh, we connected with Dakota Pottery and Dr. Donovan's on the phone with Dakota Pottery all the time in Sioux Falls. Uh, there have been incredible resources. They've sold us all of our kilns, all of our potter's wheel, and just really uh, customer support, uh, quite outstanding. So back to the, the minerals, and, and we're gonna transition now from the minerals to actually uh, the students using them. That limestone, we, we use it in, in, in glazes primarily. It's called whiting. Uh, in, in the ceramics industry. Muscovite, you know, muscovite is a, a mineral that really doesn't help us, doesn't hurt us, but it's everywhere in the Black Hills. And it, it often slows what we call the vitri vitrification, the glassy phase in, in, in ceramics, present, like I said, in these wild clays, uh, inevitably. Um, the montmorillonite, is used in small amounts to help plasticize the clays. Um, and then the, the kind of the gold standard is kaolin or sometimes called china clay. It's, it's desired because it will give you a white clay body. And thinking back to Dakota pottery, that one pot was flipped upside down. It was very white, which tells me they had a lot of kaolin somewhere between here, here in Hermosa, and it's desired for the white color and, and the properties it gives to the clay body. And then quartz, quartz is a glass former in this mix. And feldspar, this custer feldspar uh, is, is used in the glazes for the outer uh, coating. And then the wild clay can be mixtures of all of these above. And that's really what this, this shale behind the school, it's a wild clay that has a lot of montmorillonite, a little bit of kale and quartz and feldspar. So with that, we'll, we'll transition. Dr. Donovan will start uh, the, the second half talking about the, the, the products from the students. I'll position myself over here so I can hand these off. So as uh, Dr. Keller had kind of already alluded to, uh, one of the big motivating factors for us and really the shift to using what's in our backyard is a new National Science Foundation program, and we've named it Art and Engineering. So it's been a pretty great program that we've had. Uh, it's focused in, NSF has a lot of different divisions. This one is specifically in improving undergraduate STEM education. And so it's focused for our students. Some of the big components were uh, modifying labs. So as you can see, we've literally gone into our backyard, brought things into the lab. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. We've also just started on Fridays a ceramic uh, uh, extracurricular where students will come and do different clay uh, forming with us. And then also glass, we just opened a glass blowing facility. Um, 
Along those same lines, one of the new courses we just offered this spring was MET 300 and it's applied glass and ceramic engineering. So we spent some time talking about the ceramics in the hills, but then we also spent a month working with glass, melting glass, and actually doing some glass blowing as well. Um, the big theme with this was to incorporate the idea of art and engineering into our curriculum. Uh, another big component, which has been pretty awesome, is to have an artist in residence on campus. So we do have a professor who teaches art, but we have an artist just looking at the curriculum and seeing where can we be creative in terms of finding opportunities to introduce art into this. So the big goals from this were creativity. Um, hand in hand with creativity is innovation. You know, if we can be creative, we are being innovative and looking for new ways to approach ideas, problems. Collegiality is another thing, as you're gonna see, uh, as I present here soon, there's a lot of teaming that goes on. The other big thing is not just collegiality in our students, but across campus. This grant, we used three different departments came together to make it a possibility. Entrepreneurship and then student retention are some big goals from this grant. So big picture what we're trying to do with the grant. I spoke briefly about all the different courses. There's even more than this. These are the big ones that we've started integrating into. Um, MET 110 is the intro class. I really want to focus kind of on the last two, the MET 300. That was the new class we offered. That was the one where we did have an artist come in, do a glass blowing with our students, walk through um, how glass behaves through different temperatures. It was a really good experience for the students. Um, on the right-hand side here, uh, we have the young lady on the left-hand side. She's actually teaching a pinch pod, a forming technique to our students. She's our artist in residence, Professor Mitchell. And then on the bottom, she's actually inter interacting with high school students within South Dakota as well. So we're getting out into the community a little bit too, but she's been a key component of that. What I really want to focus on though, and the rest of this talk will focus on, is our MET 352, which is our junior design course. Um, it's gonna have components from both the spring 2022 and spring 2023. So everything you're, you're gonna see here is a lot of work our students have done. So. So when we start a design project, we kind of have to give them a big picture idea of what they're going to be doing. So we said you're going to be doing earthenware, ceramic pottery, and we also, for spring of 2022, we said it has to be 100% Black Hills clay. And so that was one of the parameters we set. We're uh, a little luckier uh, with our wild and feral clay. We can tame it with a, some science, which is nice. And that's what we do. Um, we, gave the students about five buckets the first year, six the second year, but we also gave them chemical analysis information. We did that with an X-ray diffraction characterization. So what this does is it gives us atomic and molecular structure of a crystal. So Dr. Keller spent a lot of time motivating all the different um, minerals these come from. This tool is really nice because it gives us both those minerals, but also elemental data. Um, we also told the students they need to uh, we, we literally handed them rocks and said, make something with it. And so they had to do the processing, the crushing, the grinding, all the way from a rock to a product. And so this is kind of a big picture on the bottom left-hand side where they literally had buckets and then they had to take it into the lab, crush it, grind it, get their hands dirty, and then add water to make uh, a clay body or a ceramic body. And then this on the right-hand side is a, uh, is a press mold. Um, moldings used through, throughout manufacturing, but this was one of the groups. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit. So the two we really focused on here were the stoneware and the red clay. That's what we were able to make with what we have in the Black Hills. So that's what the students really focused on. The one big thing I do want to point out is with our stoneware, if you look at iron oxide, it's a little bit higher at 9.5 for that red clay. Um, we see a lot of red clay around here. It's that iron giving it that color. The other fun thing about iron is it can act as a flux. And when I say flux, it'll lower the temperature and we'll talk about firing these in a second and how that iron starts playing a pretty important role. So some other design uh, considerations we made the students, you know, this is a class, so they had to write up a report. And the big thing we told them is we need to be able to reproduce what they did um, for their final product. Also, a healthy competition always seems to be good between the students. I think the most interesting thing, both between both springs, is sometimes competition can get a little cutthroat. The most amazing thing I saw was it really wasn't. It was amazing how much each team talked to each other, because there was one group, they were trying to 
froth float something, so trying to get it to separate. And the other team's like, nope, spent half a day doing that. Not a good idea. Where if it was competitive, they would have just let them like <laughs> float it for another week, right? But no, it was really good to see how all the teams talked and collaborated, um, even though it was a competition. So here's just some examples of products from those. Um, when we assessed it, uh, we did it based off of a couple different things. So product difficulty. Um, if you look at uh, on the right hand side here, we've got Grubby. Hopefully he's familiar to everyone. This is what he looked like before he was fired. And then we had uh, the glaze put on him here. Dr. Keller, I think, is handing those around. The ones in the middle are fun. These are ocarinas. I kind of want to ask, who knows what an ocarina is? Oh, that's exciting. We did not know what ocarinas were. They're a musical instrument. <laughs> so that was in the middle. Um, they 3D printed with polymer, and I'll talk about that. And then another group, they made um, a pot and so for a planter. So the, the theme was is there had to be some like school of minds, school spirit. But just looking at it from a face value, you can see, especially as Grubby goes around, there's a lot of overhangs, his hat, his bill, his nose, right? He's got a nose like me, it's quite long. So actually making this was quite challenging for difficulty, um, com you know, compared to the one on the left-hand side where we've got some squares and there's some slab buildings. So there's, you know, difficulty there uh, that we talked about, execution of piece, how good does the piece look, and then creativity as well. So these are all things we wanted to include in there, and that's really where we started, you know, introducing that creativity. How innovative can you be with your design? So one of the big things we promote in design is uh, design methodology. If you work in science, there's you know, a hypothesis. The big thing I really like to talk about with this for students though is this is a roadmap. This helps us get from that box of rocks or that bucket of rocks to a product. And so when you look at these, usually you start top bottom. Here we're gonna start left and top left, so clay formulation. As you can see, you work down through these. We have iterations here. So the first one would be about where we're at the sub 100 micron. The, the cool thing about these is once you lay these out, you can start seeing it's not like peanut butter and jelly, right? We get out the knife, wipe it. You can actually wipe the peanut butter on. You can actually do multiple things at once. So for this group, what they did is they had one person in the lab. They were breaking up the materials. They were testing to see what's happening when we're breaking them up. Are we losing? silica in the process. We had another student, they were working, theirs was rolling out a coaster and stamping it because they wanted to mass produce. So they had one student in CAD on a computer doing that. Another person looking at glazes. And they, they, this team was like, we want 100% Black Hills glaze. That wasn't something we required, but something we wanted this second year for them to push, to push on and work a little bit better for. The big thing here though is, the idea is, is we don't have to go one, two, three. It's can we optimize this and do multiple things at once. So with that, I'm gonna switch over to clay formation. We're gonna talk about glaze here a little bit. So here's the buckets that we handed our students. Um, so with these though, like I said, we can be a little bit more scientific. So we used XRD and this is uh, what an XRD looks like. So it gives us the chemical formula. It also gives us a phase. So it's talking, Dr. Keller talked about like muscovite, kaolin. Um, also take a look at this bottom line. I like that one personally. It gives us all the different metal oxides. So we have titanium, potassium, it's showing all those different elements, which is gonna be useful here in a minute. But here's Tower Road, and Dr. Keller talked about this one being near Skyline Drive. Busan Shale, you've seen this, you've probably walked right past it on your way up to M Hill. This one's got a lot of kaolin and quartz in it. Pacer or Kusterfeld Safar. This one is, I really do wanna give Pacer a shout out. They've been a very great collaborator with us, both in this class and other classes, but they actually, as he said, are, are world renowned for them. You look at a formulation for a glaze, you're gonna find Custer Feldspar there a lot. Um, and they're 85% Feldspar, 15% mica of quartz. And then Sturgis Road, if you go out Sturgis Road, you'll see this. This one is fun, we'll talk about it a little bit more here, is it's got a lot of calcium in it. Um, then also a little bit of quartz in it as well. But here's you know, what we handed the students, is they got a bucket, and they got chemical information on it, and then they had to formulate from there. So if you've been noticing a lot of these, I'll stick here, a lot of these clays have alumina and silica in it, and we've talked about, you know, the Black Hills isn't 
we're, we're not just interested in the metal ores. These two are big players in refractory. So if you've ever been to a nice restaurant, they have their brick oven pizzas. Those brick ovens, those are refractory materials. They're used in a lot of furnaces and other things. They are key players. So that's why we see, um, see alumina and silica on this. This is what's called a phase diagram. So on the X axis, we have our alumina and silica. So it's how much of that. And then our Y axis is temperature. Um, one of the big things to look at is if you look at the far left where the green meet at zero, where the green touches, it's at about 1700 degrees Celsius or about 2900 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's quite hot. One of the unique points on this is at about seven to 10% um, silica, we see what's called the eutectic point. And that's where we go from liquid to a two phase solid. And that's a really unique point, And it's something we're gonna take advantage of when we talk about glazes for sure, because it, a glaze is a ceramic coating on our clay body. And so it needs to melt before our clay body melts. So leveraging that chemistry is pretty important. So just walking through what we have here, I've taken the XRDs from the previous slide and named them. So we have Tower Road, Fusan Shale, Pacer, and Sturgis Road. Now what we're gonna do though, is we're gonna start looking at their chemical information. So here we have silica and alumina. So if we look at this on this plot, we'd be left roughly to the right-hand side, right? We're 70%, well, sorry, left-hand side um, for you guys. Um, so it's on to the left of that eutectic though, but we're still quite high in temperature. So this is a great clay body that we've seen. If we look at this one, we also have silica and alumina or to the left of that eutectic for this one. Also another great clay body. Um, for feldspar, we don't have quite as much silica as we've seen in these other two, but what silica is, is it's a glass former. So you look at through the glass windows, that's silica, um, an amorphous silica. This is a great glass former. Sturgis Road actually doesn't have a lot of it, um, small amount, and we're gonna talk about why that's important, but it is another glass former. So this is uh, what the students were looking for for clays, trying to determine how high they can fire their clays based off this chemistry. The cool thing is for us is we can use chemistry to formulate a glaze based off of this. So we can look at these and decide how we can manipulate the clay to make it a glaze. Um, for this clay body, Tower Road is pretty fun. It's got um, iron in it, and I've talked about how iron acts as a flux, so it'll lower your temperature, titanium, calcium, uh, potassium, and then it's falling off here, but sodium's also there. The nice thing about that is if we add more of that to the glaze portion, it'll take it from this high melting to much lower one. So that's really what we were wanting to do with the glaze. Um, iron's beautiful because it'll give us some color. So it's some flux and some color here. Fusan shale at this point, so we can see it's just silica and alumina, so that's great. It can still be added for a glaze. We just don't want as much of it as we would for um, other, for our clay body. Feldspar, huge thing. It's used a lot, a lot in glazes. That feldspar is perfect because it's got potassium and sodium in it, so it'll lower, lower the, that melting as well. So acting as a flux. This one was a big player for those because, for us, because we have 50% calcium, that calcium is great because it'll lower the temperature. So with a single clay body, we can, or mineral body, excuse me, we either can make it a clay or make it a glaze just based off of chemistry, which is pretty useful. So for a glaze formulation, um, we see this is one formulation, not the one these guys use, but there's a lot of different clear glazes out there, but it's got whiting, which is that calcium. And you can see the chemical information on the right-hand side. We've got feldspar, kaolin, and silica. So silica is that glass former kaolin. We get some of that alumina, with, which acts as a stiffener in our glaze, so it just doesn't heat up and run down. Um, this is one the students made. They, their big thing was, we want 100% Black Hills glaze. That was their big push. So the white part, the cool thing about this is the white is actually the clay body. Um, the glaze is clear. They made a pretty white clay body off of the Fusan shale. So all they did was take their, their clay body and modify it to make it into a glaze. Um, there's a slightly sad story with theirs. The kiln stopped halfway to firing. So it doesn't quite have the glossy feel. Um, I need to go back and refire it. But that was one challenge. Um, otherwise, they were pretty close. They had a couple others that turned out pretty well. But here's the three big players for them was that Fusan shale. It's nice white color, that Pacer, and then Sturgis. So they were able to take all of that to make the glaze. Um, and then you can see a formulation. It's not it totals to 100%. The other thing is you're like, well, what about the blue? 
we've got this nice clear. What about the blue? Um, maybe I should have said it's like 99% uh, Black Hills glaze. What we did do is we had cobalt oxide. And so they added the cobalt oxide and that's the blue you get. That being said, there is cobalt in the Black Hills. It's the Morrison Chalcedony region. And that's kind of more uh, kind of near Devil's Tower, which is part of the Black Hills. But as you can see, looking through that, it's got some cobalt in it as well. So we could have mineral processed our way to uh, uh, cobalt glaze. So here is another group. So I kind of wanted to quickly run through theirs because they had an interesting challenge. Since the other group essentially kind of had the same clay body and the same glaze, it actually worked really well to have a glaze and a clay. They matched really well. So this team, they took a different path. They wanted a red body. With that red body, they've got that iron in the clay body, which acts like a flux, so they can't go to quite as high temperatures. And so here's the breakdown of all of theirs, and they ran a ton of, ton of different tests. It was cool. The challenge, though, is they had clay at a low temp, and these glazes they were formulating were really high. So they ran into a challenge. The big thing, though, they decided to do was add borax. We're going to talk about that in a second. One thing I should talk about, too, is we're talking about temperature. You can see I gave like every example of temperature here at the bottom. Um, in the pottery and ceramic community, they talk a lot in cones. This is from hundreds of years ago when we didn't have a thermometer or a thermocouple to shove into something. We had to find, we science, the culture of the community, had to find unique ways to measure things. So it comes from cones. Um, a lot of us still think in Fahrenheit and then I think a lot of us in STEM think in Celsius. So cover the gamut. It's been interesting because I'm thinking in Celsius and programming in Fahrenheit, and I, that's about the only two languages I can speak, and I don't do it very well. But it's, it's, you'll, you'll see a lot of cones talked about. So one thing we did just from that rendition to this, we added borax. And so on the left-hand side, I didn't bring this one in, but there should be passed around here soon. We've got, for the first one, they've added 32% borax. It's got a nice glossy feel to it. Um, blaze two, once again, they added that borax. So everything is still Black Hills except for the borax. The borax has boron in it, which is like silica and acts as a glass former. So these are some of the products. Um, the white one was a commercial glaze. They wanted to use that as a baseline. And this one on the far right hand side, that's their number two glaze. So it's got a kind of nice purple hue to it. So just quickly walking back here, one of the other big components we talk about with design is iteration and you can see these feedback loops. One that we did with the students was uh, one of the students in this group, he really wanted the metallurgical engineering sword on there. The challenge we ran into is when you go to 3D print it, who here does cookie cutting at the holidays? Sometimes you get some nice imprints. If you look how tiny those letters are, we start losing resolution and the students were having problems with the stamping. So they had to go back through and find another, another way to do that. So that was the bottom one that they did. So just kind of iterations of the students going through and learning what does work, doesn't work, and trying to find a solution for those. Um, before I get too far along, you know, Dr. Keller's done a great job of talking about the history and all years, you know, even beyond what's happened in the hills. Ceramics had been around for a while, so what are we doing that's different, I guess, um, or a little bit more? How are we pushing this? Well, 3D printing is a nice uh, technology. And so one of the cool things the students did is we have both a polymer or plastic 3D printer. We also have a clay 3D printer. And so if you look in the top left, you see a white looking. This is also another ocarina. They made one in CAD. And then what they did is you can see the white one. The one right below it is kind of a bluish one. They 3D printed it. And that's how they made the molds then is they made a plaster mold around it. This is called a two part mold. Um, so great use of technology there. And the bottom part, this team, this is pretty cool. They used a clay 3D printer or a ceramic 3D printer. The cool thing about this was we also talked about mass production. How do we manufacture things? Um, it takes quite a long amount of time to make the first one and it's an amazing piece creatively. The ones on the bottom, they can make them in about eight minutes. Both sides, it's two parts and you have to put it together. So in terms of mass manufacturing, that's not too bad. So it was kind of interesting to see both teams make this. The other thing they did is, if you have a musical instrument, it's probably important to, t important to tune it. So they also used you know, apps to help tune it, which is pretty cool. Um, quickly, I did wanna include this. Last year we had a team that made shot glasses and since we're at a, a nice brewery, I thought that would be good. But you can see the different issues they ran into. So the first part was uh, just 3D printing. 
trying to figure out how do we get the, the shot glass out of the mold. I think the second one, which is the plaster mold iteration, um, you know, version two, they're like, we're pretty close. And I'm like, I'm gonna be upset if I go to a bar and I don't get a full shot. So we gotta go back and rethink this one because I'm gonna be an unhappy customer. So just learning, you know, the different iterations because just because we have the right uh, volume in plastic or our 3D printed one doesn't mean it's gonna come out that way. Um, this one was super fun. It's 3D scanning and 3D polymer printing and they use that to make a mold. Um, here's an example of a scanner. So you pl place an object and then the scan goes around it. Actually, a lot of us have these on our phones now. Most phones have the technology to be able to do a 3D scan. We did one of Dr. West and I promise we did not decapitate him to do this. We had a nice handheld one. Um, and uh, Dr. West will hopefully hold this with you with him, but it's actually a really good um, resemblance of him. He was not injured in this, but we did, he was a little surprised to see his mug on a mug for sure. Um, you know, one kind of interesting thought that came out of this, and it's slightly a sidestep from the clay, but it brought into an ethical question of, all right, we have Dr. West's mug head, right? And a scan, think of what is our responsibility with this. I think there's probably five or six Dr. West mugs in circulation at this point. <laughs> so if you find one, I don't even think, I mean, Dr. Keller was able to find some pottery on eBay. I don't know that we can find Dr. West on eBay yet. I'm keeping my eyes open. Um, but in conclusion, you know, the Black Hills contain a wealth of industrial minerals that have enabled a rich history of ceramic commercialization. And Dr. Keller did a great job walking through just the history of the hills, which is awesome. Um, for us, it's been two really great years um, in terms of integrating this component into our 352 class. Um, we've seen so much innovation and creativity from the students, and it's amazing. We, we leave it pretty open-ended in terms of they can make whatever they want. Clearly, I don't think Dr. West maybe would have said yes if he would have known his head <laughs> was going to be floating around. But, you know, they came up with some creative things. The other thing that's been fun, too, is seeing you know, the ocarinas, I think this year were something that caught us off guard, but even they're making the same item and it, the products look completely different. So it's in completely different forming processes. So it was interesting to just see that process unfold. Um, students learned a lot about the crushing, the grinding, uh, classifying. So some groups were wanting really fine and what they found is as they started grinding, they were losing key components along the way. So a lot of learning um, in that way. Also, the students had access to a lot of tools and got to use a lot of different tools. So they got to see x-ray diffraction, learn how that works and leverage it to optimize things. Um, uh, another big thing is we had a lot of special topics because uh, we teach on an every other year cycle. So, so we, it was great because we had different faculty come in and lecture on special topics like minerals, rheology of the clays. Um, obviously, if we have a press mold, that can be a very solid clay, but if we're wanting something to come through a tip or 3D printed, we need a different amount of water to dry. So that was good. And then just the new emphasis on fluxes and glazing was pretty fun this year. And next steps for us with the program, because we're here talking about the program, is really more community engagement. This summer we're going to be doing a, a workshop with high school teachers uh, not just, well, not just uh, clay bodies, but also glass and some metal working as well. So engaging with the community, both teachers and artists. Um, we also will be running the second annual uh, ceramic camp. It was pretty cool. Last year we had six high school students come in and they got to go to GCC, so the cement plant in town and get a tour of that. And that was a great experience for them. So just continuing with this community engagement and outreach. Um, some acknowledgements for this is uh, the National Science Foundation for our grant, and then um, we've talked uh, a little bit about the other departments, but some other faculty here, and then just a lot of uh, community and company support. You know, we couldn't do a lot of this without Pacer donating materials. Um, Dakota Pottery has been amazing. I do talk with them on a weekly basis, maybe more than they'd like, but they've been amazing. So just uh, a huge thank you to them. The other people I'd really like to shout out is the students. Um, obviously this is focused around them and it's been cool just to see um, some of the creativity come out of that. And then I think both Dr. Keller and my favorite references, 
Um, Science for Potters is great. This is a great intro book, goes through the clay bodies, the glazes, and then just looking to see where we can find things in the hills. This is a great reference as well. Thank you. Yes. Hey, Rich.